I used to not believe the Bible, and that changed when I read the Bible. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. Today I'm talking about why I believe the Bible while I go mining in the mining lands. The thing is, I do set aside areas to be mining lands, but whenever I do that, people just turn it into a whole civilization anyway. So apparently people have made one here too, and I haven't really checked this out yet, so what is this? Welcome to Shroom Land. Okay, people have turned this mining lands into a whole civilization. Are these houses made of mushrooms? I think people made houses out of, like, giant red mushrooms here. Um, okay, looks like everyone here has a house now. Okay, how did how did these cities pop up so quickly? And by the way, this is not supposed to be a city. This is supposed to be a mining land. But I'm getting off topic. I should be talking about the Bible, not talking about shrooms. So why do I believe the Bible? The short answer is because the Bible is the book about Jesus. A lot of people, I think, get it backwards in their thinking. Instead of thinking they believe the Bible because the Bible is the book about Jesus, they think they believe in Jesus because the Bible talks about Jesus and they believe in the Bible. But I think Jesus should come first in our order of logic, not the Bible. A lot of people start with the assumption that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and then they just believe in Jesus because the Bible says Jesus is Lord. I mean, it's still okay if that's how you came to the realization that Jesus is Lord. But I think it's better in our thought process to start with knowing that Jesus is God, that God exists, that Jesus is God, the second person of the Trinity, and then we believe the Bible because we can trust that God has given us an accurate revelation about Jesus. That's how it worked for me anyway. Because I came from a very secular leftist background, and I was taught that the Bible was completely wrong, completely anti-scientific, and then I converted to Christianity. I started to believe in Jesus, but I still did not believe the Bible. I used to... I was, how did, where did that come from? I, st I believed that Jesus was Lord, Jesus was God, I believed enough to be saved, but I still did not believe the Bible was the inerrant word of God. I used to say, I believe in Jesus, not the Bible. And give me a break, guys. I was a baby Christian at the time, so I think I can be forgiven for that. But I said that until I actually read the Bible, and I saw how every part of the Bible formed this huge connected narrative that points to Christ. I was amazed at how the Bible written over like 1,500 years, tells a consistent narrative that's really all about Jesus Christ. And that is how I came to the conclusion that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. And I say infallible. I believe the Bible is infallible. Do I believe the Bible is inerrant? I'll get into that later. First, I'm going to answer some of the criticisms of the Bible, because a lot of modern scholarship known as higher criticism, tries to explain why the Bible cannot possibly be inerrant, tries to find errors with the Bible. Usually it's something like claiming there's contradictions in the Bible, or claiming that certain parts of the Bible are forgeries, stuff like that. And the most prominent propagator of these ideas is Dr. Bart Ehrman. Now, there are a lot of atheist scholars, scholars in quotes, who try and debunk the Bible, but most of them do a horrible job at it and they just embarrass themselves. The only guy who I would say comes even close to doing a halfway decent job at arguing against the Bible is Bart Ehrman. I would say he at least provides somewhat convincing arguments. I'm not convinced, but a lot of people have been convinced by his arguments. Because he will, what he'll do is he will try and show that the Bible is not what a lot of people have been raised to think it is. A lot of evangelicals have grown up with a type of inerrancy that I call PDF inerrancy, where every detail of the Bible needs to be absolutely perfect and flawless. And if you can find the slightest flaw with any aspect of scripture, if the glass cracks, the glass cracks. If you find the slightest hair of doubt in the scriptures, it all falls apart. That's what Bart Ehrman was raised with. Bart Ehrman used to be an evangelical Christian who went to Moody Bible Institute, and he started studying the higher criticism of the Bible, and then he found some things that he thought were errors, and then it all fell apart for him. And this has happened to a lot of people who have tried studying the Bible. And he tried to hang on to his old view of inerrancy, but eventually he just gave up and spent the rest of his life arguing against, a, against the idea that the Bible was inerrant. So, what is the problem with this story? So, there are some problems, I think, with the evangelical view of inerrancy, and Inspiring Philosophy has a lot of great videos answering the things that Bart Ehrman says about the Bible and providing scholarly resources. Because a lot of times, evangelicals insist the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and good for them, 
but they don't really address the scholarship that criticizes it. Some of them do, but the vast majority of them don't. They just sort of close their ears to the scholarship. And I think we need to engage with the scholarship on this topic one way or another. Because if not, then we're just going to have sort of an anti-intellectual culture that says just believe and don't question. And then when someone does question, they start to lose their faith. And that is not what we want. So Inspiring Philosophy has a lot of really good scholarly videos answering, like, common objections to the scripture. He has a whole series, like, supposed Bible contradictions and stuff like that. And I don't agree with him theologically on everything, but he has really good resources defending the infallibility of scripture. Now, I'm not going to go through every possible defense of the scriptures. He has videos explaining that, so if he, he does a much better job than I do, and he engages a lot more scholarly work than I do, I'm just going to be talking more about like the philosophy of the Bible and the philosophy of how should we interpret and view the Bible. Stuff like that. I'll just give one example. So, Bart Ehrman claims that First and Second Timothy, among other books, are forgeries. They weren't actually written by who they say they're written by. They weren't actually written by Paul. By, by Paul. Why does he think this? Well, because they have a different writing style than the other books. And it's true. If you study the Greek and stuff, which I have not, but I'll take the scholar's word for it, if you study it, these books really do have a very different style than most of Paul's letters. So I guess that means we need to completely abandon our doctrine of scripture and conclude that the atheists are right. No, no, no. So there are alternative ways to explain the data. A lot of people just try and ignore the data and close their ears to it. But if you actually engage with the data, you'll find that there are other ways to explain it other than the conclusions that Bart Ehrman makes. Scholars like Bar Bart Ehrman they don't lie in the facts that they present, but their interpretation of the facts are just wrong. So what Inspiring Philosophy will say is that, yes, those letters were not written by Paul. But the thing is, they were authored by Paul, because in the ancient world, authorship and writing wasn't the same thing. The author was the authority figure behind a text, and the writer was the person who actually write it. People hired scribes, but the job of a scribe wasn't simply to just dictate verbatim what the author said. The scribe had a lot more liberty in writing what they wanted. So my view of books like First and Second Timothy is that um, they weren't written by Paul, but they were commissioned by Paul. Paul said to one of his scribes, write a, write a letter that says X and Y and Z. So it's still Paul's authority behind that letter, even if it's not Paul's pen that wrote it. And we know that Paul used scribes, because in Romans 16, there's this verse that says, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Wait, Tertius? Who's Tertius? I thought Paul wrote the letter. The answer is, yes, of course Paul wrote the letter. But it was also Tertius who wrote the letter, because Paul probably used this guy Tertius as a scribe. That's the only major argument against the Bible that I'm going to address in this video. I'm going to put links to Inspiring Philosophy in the, in the description. So now I'm going to talk about what my view of the scriptures is. My view is often considered too liberal for evangelicals and too conservative for my fellow mainline Protestants. Um, I hold to a more, okay, there's a skeleton shooting at me. I hold to what I would call a more neo-orthodox or Bardian view of the scriptures. I haven't read that much Karl Barth, but, and there's a lot I disagree with Karl Barth on. He was like a big 20th century theologian. But I think he was right in how we should view the scriptures, because he was taught by all liberal scholars, but then he abandoned liberalism and sought to return to more biblical orthodoxy. So what is the Bardian neo-orthodox view? So that view is basically that Christ is the Word of God, and the Bible is the Word of God because Jesus is the Word of God, because the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us through the Bible. So if you're reading the Bible without Christ, it's not the Word of God. The Bible is only the Word of God because Jesus is the Word of God. And because of that, people like me would reject the idea that the Bible is an encyclopedia of objectively true facts. They could say, okay, what does the Bible say about dinosaurs? What does the Bible... I, I don't have that view of the scriptures. And if that's too liberal for you, I'm sorry. But my view is also a lot, is way too conservative for most of my fellow mainline Protestants. Uh, but by most, I don't mean most. I, I just mean like a lot of them. <laughs> but my view of the scripture is that it needs to be Christ-centered. So, for example, I used to say that Jewish people believe 80% uh, of the Bible because they have the Old Testament. I guess it's more like 70%. The Old Testament is about 70% of the Bible, and the Jews believe the Old Testament, so they have 70% of the Word of God, right? No, because they don't believe in Jesus. And the whole purpose of the Bible is to be the book about Jesus. The Bible is only the Word of God because Jesus is the Word of God. So I would say the Jews 
don't have any of the Word of God, even though they have the text of the Bible, they only have the human aspect of the Scriptures. They do not have the divine aspect of the Scriptures. And Jesus seemed to say this when he talked about the Pharisees having, it was either Jesus or Paul, it was one of them. I'll, I'll put the quote on the screen, I'll, I'll find it somewhere. Talking about the, the Pharisees having the Word of God, but being completely blinded to it. So I think this neo-Orthodox view of Scripture is biblical. Uh, and Jesus said, like, um, like, I speak in this way so that only you can understand it or something. I think uh, that is in line with Barth's doctrine of Scripture, which is also in line with Calvinism. Because, um, first of all, uh, what I'll say is the Bible is the Word of God because Jesus is the Word of God. And we know that Jesus is truly human and truly divine. Likewise, the Bible is a truly human text and a truly divine text. So the Bible is not 100% divine uh, or 0% human. The Bible is also not 50% divine, 50% human. The Bible is a truly human text and a truly divine text. A lot of people are taught that this Bi the Bible is some magic book, and then they read it and they see it has a very human character and quality to it, and then they lose their faith. But the thing is, we shouldn't be surprised to see that the Bible looks like a human text, because it is a human text, but it's also a divine text. The beautiful thing about the Bible is that through this mosaic of human texts, we see the overarching message of Christ. A few weeks ago, I made a big YouTube video um, about the Bible, what each book of the Bible is about, and I said each book of the Bible is like a gem that the light of the Holy Spirit shines through. But when we put it all together, we see the overarching message of Christ. And then I had the gems come together and be like a mosaic, and then the mosaic formed a cross, and then I faded to just an illuminated cross, and everyone loved that. A lot of people are asking me to make like a t-shirt and some other merch out of that mosaic. Um, tell me what you guys think. I don't want to sell out because I don't need your guys' money. But if you guys really want me to make a t-shirt out of that, I will. But there was actually theology behind it. I sort of snuck some of my Bardian theology there because my view is that the words on the page of the Bible in isolation aren't necessarily the Word of God, but they are the Word of God because the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us through them, and Christ is the Word of God. So there's a, just like Jesus has a human nature and a divine nature, there's a human nature to the Bible and a divine nature to the Bible. And I would say people who don't read the Bible in faith are only really seeing the human aspect of the Bible. And if you guys think that's too liberal, I'm like, again, I'm sorry. But think about it. Would you really say that these Orthodox Jews who deeply, deeply study the scriptures are studying the word of God? I really don't think they are because the Pharisees were the experts on the scripture and Orthodox Jews, they spend their entire lives studying the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and they never come to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord. So I think if we say that the Bible is still objectively the word of God for them, then are we saying the word of God isn't clear if they can study it so much and not come to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord? I think we have to say that the Bible is the means through which the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us, but the Holy Spirit doesn't do that for everyone, and that is in line with Calvinism, that the Holy Spirit does not reveal Jesus to everyone, and it's only those whom God chooses that the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to. I know a lot of you guys won't like that, but um, I'm, I'm, just, I'm being honest about what I, what I believe. So that's why I say the books of the Bible are gems, that the light of the Holy Spirit shines through. But a lot of people read the Bible in darkness. And I've heard a lot of stories of people saying um, they used to read the Bible and it made absolutely no sense to them. But once they began to have faith in Jesus, the Bible, it all clicked. It suddenly made sense. And that's what happened, that's what happened with me. So that is why I think that about the Bible. And another way that um, Bart's doctrine of Scripture is in line with Calvinism is because of the Calvinist view of the sacraments. The Calvinist view of the sacraments is that each sacrament has two parts, the sign and the thing signified. For uh, Holy Communion, the sign is the bread and wine, the thing signified is the body and blood of Christ, but only the elect receive the, the thing signified along with the sign. Those who do not have faith only receive the sign and nothing else. So, unlike Roman Catholics, Calvinists would say the bread is only the body of Christ for those who have faith in Christ. When an unbeliever eats the bread and wine in communion, they're just receiving bread and wine. They're not receiving the body and blood of Christ. It's only believers that receive the body and blood of Christ. So we can apply that to scripture. The sign in the scriptures, I would say, is just the bare words on the page. And when an unbeliever reads the scriptures, that's the only part they're getting. They're just getting the sign. However, when a believer reads the scriptures in faith, 
They're getting the sign, the words on the page, and the things signified, which is the revelation of Christ, that the Holy Spirit shines through the scriptures. I think that's a more consistent doctrine of scripture, but my view, in effect, is basically the same as just the regular evangelical view of inerrancy. I think it just accounts for some of the discrepancies that we see, because if you have that view, if you have the view that the, the text of the Bible is really the means through which the Holy Spirit reveals the Word of God to us, then you don't need to worry about certain textual variations in the scriptures. For example, when Jesus said, uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There is actually scholarly debate as to whether that was in the original text of Scripture. And if you have the more evangelical view of inerrancy, you're going to have anxiety about that. It's like, how do I know what the Word of God is if some of the texts are in question? Now, the vast, vast majority of the texts of the Bible are not in question, but there are some that are. So can we still be, uh, be blessed and can we still profit from Bible texts that are in question? I would say yes, if you have a more Bardian, neo-Orthodox view of Scripture. If you see the text on the page as the means through which the Holy Spirit reveals the Word of God to us, you don't need to obsess as much over the details. And that's really the only difference between inerrant and infallible. I'm not denying the Bible's inerrant. I'm just saying I don't like to use that term because there's so many different definitions of it and different people mean different things. Like the Bible uses 40 years or 40 days as a common motif. Does that mean it needs to be exactly 40, not 39, not 41? Some people who say they hold to inerrancy would say, no, it doesn't need to mean exactly that. Some people I've heard say it does need to mean exactly that because the Bible needs to be perfect. And if it's 39 days instead of 40, then the Bible's not perfect. So I would reject that type of inerrancy, I think. Or not reject it, maybe just be more skeptical of it. But actually, I think I would reject it because it's pretty clear that the ages of the patriarchs in Genesis are meant to be symbolic numbers. Um, and Inspiring Philosophy has a good video explaining why that is, in case you don't believe me. And I think he makes a very compelling case for it, from the Bible. So, what are some other benefits of having a sort of Bardian New Orthodox view of Scripture? Well, like I said, it parallels the doctrine of the sacraments. So, just like the, um, the sacraments are sign and things signified, we could say the Word of God is sign and things signified. The sign being the words on the page, and the things signified being the revelation of Christ that we see through the Scriptures. So that is, that is one of the big benefits. That sort of makes a lot of sense to me. And that's that causes us to have a much more Christ-centered view of Scripture. And I think every book of the Bible, in some way, points to Christ. And a lot of, a lot of theologians... Okay, yes, finally, this is, this is what I came here for, diamonds. A lot of theologians have said that. That's, that's not a uniquely Bardian perspective. But I think it's most consistent with a Bardian perspective to say that. To say, if you believe that... Christ is the Word of God, and the Bible is the means through which the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us, that is a lot more consistent with saying every part of the Bible points to Christ. If you just think the Bible is some encyclopedia of true facts, even in facts about things that have nothing to do with Jesus and the Gospel, then it's a bit less consistent to say every verse of the Bible points to Christ. Like Michael Heiser, he, um, uh, the late Michael Heiser, unfortunately, He's a, he's a smart guy, and there's a lot of stuff of his that I like, but his whole divine counsel theory tries to use the Bible as like a textbook for the spiritual world, which I wouldn't necessarily agree with. And Michael Heiser did say there are some parts of the Bible that are not about Jesus, and that is something I definitely disagree with. Because he really did seem to try and build a whole system of theology based on the weird parts of the Bible. He even said that. He said, my expertise is on the weird parts of the Bible. I also think the Bardian view prevents weird conspiracy theories about the Bible. Like, some people are engaged in endless speculation over what the Nephilim are. And, okay, whatever your, your answer of what you think the Nephilim are, is this relevant to Jesus and the Gospel, or is it just a conspiracy theory? I mean, my personal belief about the Nephilim is that they are... But absolutely nobody agrees with me on that. Okay, I got one diamond. That's kind of that's kind of what I came here for, I guess. Uh, I guess I'll go back now. Um, I guess I'll just explore this land a bit while I'm finishing out this video. So yeah, that's my view of scripture. To put it simply, I believe the Bible because the Bible is the book about Jesus. Because I already believe in Jesus. And what's so amazing about the Bible is even though it was written over the span of so many years, so many years, it still tells this consistent narrative of Jesus. And that doesn't diminish from the human quality of the Bible. 
every part of the Bible is a human text, but every part of the Bible is also the Word of God when we read it in faith. And an important reason to say this is to distinguish the Christian view of the Bible from the Muslim view of the Quran. I think of a lot of evangelicals, especially like John MacArthur types, see the Bible the way Muslims see the Quran. Muslims don't believe the Quran is a human text at all. Muslims believe that Allah, God, dictated word for word the Quran to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. And that the Quran is not human words at all. It's just 100% divine words and 0% human words. And you can find some pretty obvious errors in the Quran. Like the Quran misrepresents the Christian doctrine of the Trinity, saying that the Trinity is Jesus, God, and the Virgin Mary. It, so the Quran clearly is not a divine text but that's the Muslim doctrine of the Quran. The Christian doctrine of the Bible, Christians believe the Bible is just as divine as Muslims believe the Quran is, but the Christians also believe that the Bible is truly human, and that ties into our doctrine of the Incarnation. Because Muslims don't believe in the Incarnation. Muslims don't believe that God can become man, but Christians do believe that God became man in Jesus. The whole message of Christianity is God condescending to us, God taking on human flesh to become like us. And I think the Bible's the same way. The Bible is God revealing the truth of Christ to us, not revealing it in a vacuum, but revealing it sh through truly human texts. So guys, that's about it for this video. That's my doctrine of scripture. That's why I believe in the scriptures. And I know some of you really won't like my view of it, but something to think about. So thanks for watching and I'll see you later. Bye.